we want to go over some um, caveats that revolve around the frequently asked questions that we get, uh, particularly Lyme. Lyme is the most prevalent disease transmitted by ticks in the United States, and it ended up being 90% of this talk, and I think it's, uh, it reflects what, what we see in our practice. Um, we do want to be aware of the new work, quote-unquote, um, or less frequently encountered ticks, uh, or rather, better said, tick-borne diseases. And uh, we're going to spend a little time talking about um, some relevant controversies that, as healthcare providers, we all need to be aware surrounding Lyme. Uh, let's start with the case. Um, so this is an, and this is a, a vignette. This this is inspired on a real patient, but it ended up being a little bit changed. So this is an 18-year-old uh, male that on Sunday, June 17th, was hiking in Wisconsin. That same night, he performed a tick check, which is a, um, actually a recommended procedure by current guidelines to prevent tick-borne diseases. He discovered a tick, indeed, and it was uh, the size of a poppy seed. He removed this as it is uh, recommended with tweezers, as opposed to just brush it or pull it. He removed it correctly with uh, tweezers, uh, exerting pressure from both sides. The tick did not break, did not release anything, any fluid or whatnot that he could appreciate. The tick did look engorged, though. So that was the same night he was um, hiking. Um, on Monday, so that would be um, uh, the next day, uh, the area it was red and pruriginous. And by Tuesday, he felt this was going nothing better, so he presented to our clinic. He's back in Iowa. Um, and so he has this lesion. So what to do now? So I guess if I click answer now, if people are ready, people have all the answers response at all. But um, so should we, I mean, there's two extremes here, right? So start treatment for Lyme disease with the appropriate doxycycline 100 PO for 14 days. The other extreme is reassure him. Um, you know, we're pretty sure he does not have Lyme disease and he will not get in it from this tick bite. And in, in between it's, well, let's get some serologies or let's give this, those that I'm not sure if people are familiar with, uh, 200 PO single dose. So I'm gonna hit answer now. Aha, uh -huh. wait a minute. Okay, so people do not want to reassure this person. <laughs> well, I'm glad we, we have we have some topic, uh, some, some good uh, things to talk about today, it looks like. So in order to answer this question, let's go to the basics of Lyme disease. Um, so it is the most frequently reported tick-borne disease in the United States. It is prevalent or endemic, better word, in the north east uh, area of um, our country in in uh, the upper midwest as well as you see so connecticut i mean lime is in connecticut so all that area on the new england area but also wisconsin and minnesota and a lot of cases that we see in iowa you see some scattered dots here um, come actually from there because we have greater mobility to, to those areas uh, you can see here the number of confirmed cases of Lyme reported to the CDC, and they're hover around uh, um, anywhere between 20 and, and 30,000 um, over the past 10 years. So they're relatively frequent, and these are the, the hot areas to get Lyme. In Iowa, we had 72 cases in 2011. So briefly, um, Lyme disease is a bacterial illness, let's not forget, it's caused by Borrelia, Borrelia burgdorferi, which is this spirochete or uh, spiral-shaped bacterium. Uh, the sine qua non, the, the condition that you need to get in order to get the disease is being beaten by, by a tick. There is no transmission on li of Lyme disease documented ever in blood transfusions. It is plausible um, and through, uh, it's been tested in animals, but it hasn't ever been reported. So the vectors are, are two, and they um, have to do with the uh, two locations that we uh, mentioned. The main one that is 
even worth uh, memorizing the name just to navigate the literature more easily would be Ixodes scapularis. Um, two names, deer tick or black-legged tick. Um, you saw here that there was a little bit of um, lime in the Pacific coast, and that's relatively rare, but that's transmitted by the western black-legged tick. Um, and this, this guy, they look <clears throat> different, but Ixodes scapularis is by all means the, more free, the most frequent vector. Um, we talked about that this is a disease of the spring and in the um, warm weathers, and this reflects that. I hope people can see that the legend down here is the months of the year, and this is all the cases accumulated, reported to the CDC from 2001 to 2010. So May through August is the hot season to get Lyme. Now, when we, okay, we're going to go over the <clears throat> specific manifestations of Lyme and then come back to this and explain why there are some cases you see here still in January and November and December. So what you get in the summer, you're bitten by a tick and you first get an inoculation of the spirochete of the, of the Borrelia in your skin and that causes this classic reaction, the erythema migrants. Uh, so the bull's eye rash that everybody talks about. That would be called the early localized disease. Once that reaches the bloodstream, it seeds distant areas. <clears throat> this is a spirochete. We don't recover it in blood cultures. It's very hard to culture, but it's been uh, demonstrated to, um, I mean, people do get bacteremic from this, and this seeds other areas. So where? other areas in the skin, so you end, end up with reproducing that erythema migrants elsewhere in your body. Heart, joints, and central nervous system, both um, central and peripheral. Uh, in the heart, the classic manifestation, though rare, is AV, blo AV nodal blocks, anywhere from first degree block to third degree block. Arthritis is much more common and it's typically seen in the knees. Um, we've seen a couple of them in a couple of years here. And um, it's typically a monoarthritis or one knee or, or uh, oligoarthritis, a couple of joints. Um, <clears throat> neurologic involvement most frequently and most classically involves the seventh specifically cranial nerve. It can involve any cranial nerve um, but also radiculopathy and meningitis. Um, so we, one wouldn't think of uh, somebody displaying a radial radiculopathy, for instance, uh, of Lyme, but that's in the differential for sure. And meningitis is actually rare by Lyme, but it does happen. Late disseminated disease um, occurs much later, actually. Um, this would be within days. This too, actually, are within days and past the month we're seeing the late disseminated phase, which is essentially seeding uh, in the same locations, but it specifically manifests with these two and only these two manifestations arthritis and central nervous system compromise. Now, to appraise you how, this, how rare this is, the real documented neurological late disseminated disease, the people who wrote the 2006 Infectious Diseases Society of America guidelines for Lyme disease altogether had seen nine cases in their whole life, and those are the na national experts. So real, true documented cases of encephalomyelitis, so a syndrome that mimics MS, and radiculopathy are that rare. So most uh, Lyme diseases that we are going to encounter is going to be erythema migrants, a little bit of arthritis, and uh, cranial nerve palsy. Now, in the early localized or early disseminated disease, people present as well with these protein symptoms of fever, chills, headache, and arthralgias. They can not have any of those, but they, they can too, and they can precede um, the obvious manifestation. So just for one day or two, it could be a little bit hard to diagnose, but then um, these things start popping up. So again, the time frame. Early is within the month, essentially, no earlier than three days generally. And in the case of early disseminated, we're talking mostly up, um, after the week, the tick, uh, after the tick bite. 
and late disseminated, we're talking moms, and it's seen also after years. I mean, you see people who have intermittent or chronic arthralgias from that. So that's a, um, and I was uh, informally chatting with Dr. Gerbrecht, he tells me he hasn't seen one of those uh, in years. So that, we get to the rare uh, situations there. Uh, this doesn't necessarily occur, occur sequentially, so you may end up diagnosing late disseminated Lyme disease on somebody who never had an erythema migrans. So again, to give you an idea of the frequency of this, uh, erythema migrans is by far the most frequent, um, so accounts for 70% of the cases reported to the CDC. Obviously, this doesn't add up because it overlaps, some of them overlap, but as you see, the AV node block occurs in a very minority of people. Meningitis and encephalitis by Lyme is actually rare too, and so is radiculopathy. And this is important to remember for what we're going to take or talk a little bit uh, later about um, this um, unfortunate situation, social situation, if you wish, of people who believe their chronic symptoms are uh, due to Lyme disease. Um, the actual documented cases of neurological Lyme disease are, are, are few. And to explain again why we're still seeing some reports of um, Lyme in the cold moms is well because those are mostly the people who present with late Lyme disease after being beaten in the summer. <clears throat> so this was not erythema migrans. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. The most important one in the history is that, and this is hard science, I mean, this is a point in Lyme disease management that is really well studied. Um, the Borrelia burgdorferi is not transmitted from the tick to humans um, in less than 24 hours of tick attachment. In fact, the IDSA guidelines quote now 36 hours because it needs time to migrate from the mid-gut of the, of the tick to the, um, to the jaws, if you wish. Um, erythema migrans, I mean, on purpose we put this picture, and this is, again, this is not a real patient of us. We kind of constructed this case, inspired on a patient, and we mixed it with a, a picture from the internet. But on purpose, we put this um, uh, lesion next to a, uh, a coin, so you can appreciate it's certainly not greater than five centimeters. And erythema migrans is typically greater than five centimeters. Erythema migrans is typically not pruriginous nor painful. So <clears throat> this doesn't quite look like erythema migrans. So actually, the answer for this uh, gentleman was what seven percent of you picked, which is reassure him. <laughs> okay. So um, let's learn a little bit more about erythema migrans, so we can go over the others. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so this is more like it. <laughs> this is erythema migrans. So this is uh, the husband of a co-fellow of, of mine in um, my uh, infectious diseases training, and she was nice enough to send me the picture of when he had erythema migrans from Lyme disease. As you see, well, it's not the perfect bull's eye lesion. It just, just has a discolored center. And this one, which uh, credit goes to Don John, uh, Dr. John Ockot, and this is an internet publicly available picture, um, it doesn't have central clearance at all. Okay, so but you can appreciate the common uh, pattern here. This is a gigantic lesion as compared to that one that we saw. So that one that we saw could grow into this, but I mean it would have started to grow already. So this was not a team of migrants. This is. So. One of the options that some people pick, I uh, talked about this, doxycycline times one. I wonder if um, this is news to people. Um, I learned about this two years ago, and it was out there apparently since 2001. But essentially, um, there is a well-conducted study that supports that we can actually give post-exposure prophylaxis. So you're bitten by a tick that you presume has Lyme, you get doxycycline times one, and you really prevent infection. So um, it was a study that tested this dose. Um, the treatment group obviously received doxycycline, the other one placebo, 
and you can see, I mean, only one person of 235 actually developed Lyme, whereas in the other group, eight infections out of 247. So if we calculate the number needed to treat how many people we need to give Doxy to uh, prevent one infection, it's 35. Uh, it, this has been criticized that um, they didn't follow up for too long, so we don't really know if they developed neurologic Lyme or something, but um, definitely there was a decrease at least on the erythema migrants. So actually, that's current recommendation. But the IDSA, and I've been quoting these guidelines, um, um, when they write their, their guidelines, they are on a mission for us not to overuse antibiotics, and I totally agree. So they have this almost um, hilarious uh, criteria, but they, are, they make sense, very stringent. So, I mean, if we strictly adhere to this, very few people are really going to get this doxycycline prophylaxis. So, well, first of all, the, oops, people who are non, I mean, you don't give this to pregnant people. Doxycycline is uh, maybe deleterious to the features, to small children. Uh, but it needs to adhere to within 72 hours of exposures. You need to be sure this was an Ixodes scapularis nymph or adult. It needs to be engorged, and somebody needs to figure out whether it's attached for 36 hours. So, um, <clears throat> And then this one is the hardest one to figure out, the incidence rate in the county greater than 20. Certainly not, not Iowa. So, I mean, anybody who comes in with a tick here in Iowa, and I'm guilty of doing the, the opposite, Anybody um, who comes from a tick that they picked up in Iowa is probably not worth this prophylaxis. If they somehow present to you with a tick they picked up in a more endemic area um, in, uh, in New England, well, be my guest, you probably are better off giving doxycycline. So just to give you an idea of what how small these ticks are, I mean, this is important for people to understand, well, most people don't really recall the tick bite because this is such a tiny thing. So this would be the larvae, this is the nymph, uh, and these are the adults, the male and the female. So this guy and these guys can uh, transmit Lyme. So it helps to remember that the nymph is about the size of a poppy seed, not about the size of a, a whole uh, cake, but the poppy seed. <laughs> Okay, hope that sticks. And this, the big one is more like the size of a sesame seed and not the size of the Chinese uh, sweet here. But, but basically, um, they are tiny. They're, they're little things. And, and when I say I'm guilty to give this to somebody, to give the doxy to somebody with a tick bite, that thing was obviously longer or, or larger. So um, you learn this by experience, of course. Uh, just to give you an idea of how they engorge when, when they uh, bite, so they become more visible, but not that much. So let's, okay, so wrapping up the first case, um, you give prophylaxis when you're absolutely sure this a person was bitten by an exotic stick on a high prevalence area. Probably you're not going to be doing much here. Um, in the other, the other point is erythema migrans is a big lesion, it's five centimeters or or, or, or greater. Um, and when in doubt, you can afford to, to observe. You know, if you have a lesion, you can mark it down, you can have the, come, have the patient come back, and that's also in the guideline. So it is not a severe debilitating disease if you let it go at that stage. So the second case is a 21 year old man with no significant past medical history, single, no recent travel. Um, he presents in March, and he complains of this, fatigue, of this fatigue, diffuse myalgias, and subjective fever for a month. He firmly believes he has Lyme disease. So he gives you, or uh, he gives us an, a history of treated Lyme disease a year before, somewhere where we don't have records of. Um, and at that time, he presented with um, arthralgias only, no rash, and he says that this was confirmed by some kind of some kind of, some kind of serology. You examine him; it's, it's unremarkable. So, <clears throat> CBC, liver enzymes, his creatinine, TSH were all unremarkable. So he insists to get a test for Lyme, and the primary care doctor gets a Western blot for Lyme. So this is what we get, um, and this is actually um, from Epic. So it's. I mean, I can't imagine the number of calls uh, I get about this 
results because they, they are really confusing how they're presenting to start with. And this is one of the straightforward ones. Um, and one gets confused even looking at it because, uh, you know, is it positive or negative at the end? So <clears throat> what this is showing you is um, what the Western blot's blot is, which is all the um, Western blot um, separates antigens of the Lyme bacterium and it tests the serum against them specifically. So five of these 10 guys need to be positive to make up for a positive IgG, okay? And the criteria here for the IgM, okay, so IgG chronic, right? IgM acute. The criteria for the IgM um, is that two of these guys need to be positive. So in this case, um, this guy is being tested by this technique of Western blood, and he comes in with a uh, negative IgG, um, so if you wish, the chronic uh, antibody, and a strongly positive, if you wish, IgM. So that's the interpretation of this. And this is actually from Epic, as I mentioned. So, so what do you do now? Um, do you want to give him a trial of treatment for assuming or, or you just diagnosed a relapse of his late disseminated Lyme disease? Uh, you want to double check and repeat that Western blood before you do anything? Uh, you want to inform him that this is unlikely Lyme disease? Just look for other stuff. Sexual history, if he has some sexual history, do some HIV, RPR um, for syphilis. Or in the other extreme, reassure. Um, inform him that his results are consistent with past Lyme disease, so he doesn't have it now, so. Oh my God, okay. <laughs> um, take me a minute to um, reassure him, uh, okay. Good, people are getting into the mood of reassurance and stuff. Um, okay, the actual correct answer, well, it was a tie, but the correct answer is number three. So, and why? So we're gonna go over the basics again. Now, in um, all these articles we reviewed, we didn't find a real good graphic explaining what happens to the serology of, of um, Borrelia burgdorferi. So, so here's a sketch I made myself. Um, it's by no means a scale, at scale. So you get bitten by a tick, okay, in time zero. Then your IgM, acute, right, starts racing, and that's pretty quick. So pretty quick in the sense that it comes and goes. Um, the first two weeks you don't really appreciate much, but in between weeks two and four, there is this peak, and it almost disappears past week four or five. So that's, that's the IgM. So let's see what happens with the IgG. It would appear a little bit later, as it usually does on any disease. And if the patient is asymptomatic, it will eventually come down. And, and I couldn't pin down from um, the literature exactly when, but it appears to be like it can last months or years. And finally, if you do end up having one of those late disseminated disease conditions that we, that we presented, like the arthritis, or um, if you happen to have the um, uh, encephalomyelitis, the um, <coughs> IgG would be maintained. So from this, we can learn a couple of quick things. At the beginning, uh, if we test somebody, say, that presents at three days or seven days, we're not gonna get anything, okay? Uh, the graph should have put a flat line here, rather, that to express better that point. Um, that's number one. So do you don't get IgM or IgG at the beginning? Nothing. Second of all, past four or five weeks, you're not supposed to get IgM, period. You're just supposed to get IgG if you're sick, okay? You can get the IgG if you're not sick anymore, too, but um, the farther in time, the more consistent is that if you're sick, you're gonna have a positive IgG. If you're not sick, you're not gonna have anything. And certainly, you're not expecting to see IgM anymore in the panorama after, after it came down. So based on this, um, we can kind of uh, make this conclusion. So there, there is, so after four to six weeks, an infected patient who shows an IgM, so if they happen to show an IgM here, 
Well, they must have an IgG already. I mean, they should be in this ballpark, right? So, uh, excuse me. Um, they should have a positive IgG already. If they don't, this strongly suggests that the IgM is, is a false positive. And it turns to be that there is a lot of false positives, period. So 1.5 to 8% people tested turn out to be false positives for IgM. So there is a number of reasons for that, from rare to more frequent, um, relapsing fever. I mean, the epidemiology doesn't overlap. Relapsing fever is more in the south. Rocky Mountain spotted fever also in the south, and we're going to talk briefly about it. Uh, but how about lupus or any other condition that raises your ANA? That can make your serology for Lyme positive. Epstein Barr virus and C CMB. Well, with this, we pretty much covered all the rest of people who have <laughs> false positive tests. And how about these other spirochetes? Well, leptospirosis, not that common. But how about periodontal disease? There are spirochetes in your, in your mouth. And even if you don't have terrible uh, tooth abscess or something, you do have these spirochetes acting up, and they can uh, give you um, positive serology. Lastly, labor laboratory contamination. So bottom line, you don't need to be super sick to have um, a positive IgM for Lyme. So going back to our, our gentleman, uh, as I said, the correct response is, well, there is no reason why this guy should have IgM. And then what am I kind of disregarding his symptoms? I'm not. Um, let's go back, if I think it's worth, to, to this um, picture. If you notice, the word here is arthritis, right? So arthritis and arthritis, so inflammation, swollen knee, or swollen joint for that matter, is different from arthralgia, okay? So arthralgias are part of the protein uh, syndrome of many tick-borne diseases, and they, as you know, happen on many other conditions that are even non-infectious. So, But if you have arthralgia alone, or myalgia alone, or fatigue alone, you cannot blame it on Lyme disease. I mean, you need to have one of these things that on purpose I put pictures here so people remember these are the things you want to have to make a solid diagnosis for Lyme. Everything else is not even worth testing. Okay, so that's that's what this case comes back to. Um, so this guy um, should, shouldn't have been, I mean, we shouldn't have um, fallen for his uh, desires to be tested, right? More importantly, we need to rule out other stuff that are more serious, like the HIV or the syphilis, um, that could give you this um, positive uh, test. So, okay, we went over this. Okay, so briefly, this is what the CDC recommends, and this is what we do, actually. However, in this case, the regular procedure was bypassed, and then we get in trouble. So what do I mean? Um, this is called a two... Um, here testing for Lyme disease, and it, it is this way for a reason. So there's two tests involved. So the first one is um, ELISA or EIA, um, other hospitals, we use ELISA. Um, other places use e, I, um, immunofluorescence and that's fine. But the point in case is that this is a sensitive test, poor specificity. The second test is a Western blot that we mentioned, and that's what this guy had done. Um, it's not terrifically uh, sensitive or specific, but it's a little bit more than this. Um, so in between the two, you sort out the cases of Lyme, but not with one, okay? So the testing for Lyme always, and that's what CDC emphasizes and IDSA emphasizes too, always needs to include both. So you don't bypass the, the first step. So how does this really play out in practice? Well, you do the EIA or the ELISA. Um, if it's positive or even if it's equivocal or indeterminate, you check and basically you check out a Western blot. Here we just um, request a Western blot period and it gives you IgG and IgM. But if you were given the choice, you should avoid, and that's a, a very important point, you should avoid checking IgM unnecessarily beyond 30 days for the reasons we just mentioned. I mean, at that point, it's more likely to be a false positive. And unfortunately, we've seen a fair amount of those. That for one reason or the other, they got the IgM, and they are, they're positive for that. There's no other explanation for their fatigue, and, and we're stuck. 
So it's important not to bypass this. Uh, a negative result, of course, you consider a, an alternative diagnosis. Um, importantly, um, and this is, mm, yes, we're going to make uh, the point here. So basically, erythema migrans is the only phase of the disease, the early disease that you can diagnose. Let's go back to the, um, because the erythema migrans would likely happen in this period, you don't really need uh, a serology to diagnose it. Plus, the erythema migrans is pretty much a definition of Lyme, so, so you don't need to prove it's Lyme. Um, anything else, okay, anything else in that nice picture of all the um, manifestations of Lyme, anything else needs to be, um, in order to be a confirmed diagnosis, needs to be tested with uh, serology. And when we said serology, we're speaking kind of generically, but we're specifically referring to the two thyroid testing. So we're going to do an ELISA. So any patient you think, okay, I need to do an, a study for Lyme, it's an ELISA and a Western blood after that, if positive. Um, am I losing people with that one? It's just, this is this comes up very frequently. Um, so again, is serology useful in edema migrants? No clinical diagnosis, okay. Um, when in serious doubt, okay, you see a rash that you're not quite sure, well, you go ahead and treat, okay, but you can resort to these acute and convalescent titers to kind of give closure to the patient and to be able to um, achieve a diagnosis and eventually report it, because this is a reportable disease to the, um, so the way, just speaking of, about that, since I don't have a slide on that, to report, you just contact the Iowa Department of Public Health. They should take care of all the uh, information that the CDC requires. <clears throat> okay, so we are done with the early phases, right? We talked about erythema migrants. Um, we kind of skip talking about a specific case of um, um, early disseminated Lyme disease, uh, but the same, what we said, applies. Now we get to this quote-unquote chronic Lyme disease, okay? The formal literature, the experts don't like the word chronic Lyme disease for a reason, and here's why. Hopefully this goes smoothly. This is um, from the Infectious Diseases Society of America. It's about two minutes and a half. So, and it's for patients, so it's kind of very easy to understand. The vast majority of patients troubled by the Lyme disease infection receive oral antibiotics for generally 14 days. Many patients will come into my office and others with a diagnosis of chronic Lyme disease. And I think it's a label that's used very liberally uh, by some physicians uh, who have patients who have symptoms such as fatigue, muscle aches, and headaches uh, that aren't easily explained. Hold out your hands for me there. Okay, that looks like they make fists. Okay. Their practice seems to be wholly dependent on this diagnosis of chronic Lyme disease, which is not based on scientific fact. Many people are given long-term antibiotics without really a good reason, meaning that they didn't have any history of rash, they didn't really have laboratory tests that seem to confirm this diagnosis, yet they're given the label, given antibiotics. Long-term use of antibiotics can lead to a variety of problems. You can have bad reactions to the antibiotics. It can create superbugs, resistant bacteria. Uh, they can upset your GI tract. If people have intravenous catheters, they can clot or get new infections and land them in the hospital. Many patients come in upset that uh, they're often charged substantial fees or, or asked to purchase products in their offices and they've often used those or seen the doctor at substantial cost over a period of months or even years, have you noticed any changes yet in yourself just with the first few days? One of the things I'm passionate about is that I really want to see any patient who does not feel better and thinks they have a Lyme disease diagnosis because more often than not, the diagnosis is not correct and they're not going to benefit from long-term antibiotics. So the, the best thing is to get them on the right path by understanding what their actual diagnosis is and then a good treatment path to get them feeling better. So there have been two randomized control trials actually on uh, people who believe um, have chronic Lyme disease um, 
and um, they have basically shown no improvement on two different courses of antibiotics uh, of a month duration. So just to, as a reference, uh, the IDSA had to put this specifically in the guidelines, things that are not rec recommended for uh, treatment of Lyme disease because of this problem that Dr. Adwater just described. Um, so people do do this, uh, all these IV treatments that are clearly, I mean, some of this, like metronidazole, are not even effective, uh, eff efficacious in vitro for Lyme disease. So it makes no sense to give this kind of treatment, and the list goes on. Uh, we've had our share of, of these patients. It's, um, it's an unfortunate situation because they believe firmly what's going on, and what we can tell them is, well, it's, um, uh, I, I'm not sure if 20 years down the road we're gonna diagnose, be able to diagnose chronic Lyme disease, but what I'm sure is that but it's not the current standard of care to give you IV antibiotics for a year, and, and we've seen that. Um, so actually for 19 years, and that, that's, that's a real case. I don't wanna give more specifics because um, it might give up the patient. Um, so specifically also the CDC has put out a list of tests that should not be um, performed um, for Lyme disease, uh, and Dr. Schlick can echo me on this. Um, of most note, this involved in-house criteria for interpretation of immunoblots or Western blots. Um, we see also a specific laboratory, and it was met, it's worth mentioning it, it's Igenix Lab in Palo Alto, California, that they uh, run their own criteria for Western blot. I mean, instead of doing those five out of 10 bands that we showed, they, uh, I, I believe they required three or so. So it's, uh, and people who believe have Lyme disease end up always somehow tested in this lab. So it's kind of a circuit. I guess people should be aware of that. Um, in, well, it takes a long conversation with the patient to get them on the right track. So, um, last case of the day, so 75-year-old man from Missouri, um, and this is also a hybrid between a made-up case and a real case, okay? 75-year-old uh, man from Missouri en route to Minneapolis in July, and he, when he started driving, he had myalgias, arthralgias, subjective fever, and he decided to drive anyway. So, very fortunately, he stopped at Almighty Mary Greeley Medical Center in Ames, Iowa, and the temperature was at that point 38.1, with our vitals unremarkable otherwise. In his exam, he had this little guy. Now, he's coming from Missouri, going to Minneapolis. He hasn't gone into Minneapolis yet, okay? So, it's just Missouri and everything in between there and here. So, what is the diagnosis? Um, options are there, so... Oh, are you sure? <laughs> How many people? Oh, one response, come on. <laughs> Let's just do this again. Polling closed. Let me. Uh, looks like it's gone. Tim, can we fix this one? It would be really nice to, to know who. Oh, he's messing with the computer now. See? All right. Okay, take your time. And. Responses to 13, 14, 20. Come on. All right. One, two, three. Over. Nice. Okay. So anybody wants to defend um, number four? I'm kind of directing to somebody I thought could have responded that. Just... Which is the right answer, okay? So, okay, anyway, we'll do it <laughs> anonymously. Um, okay, so this guy has this condition that I just want to uh, inform people who might have not heard about it because it's, it's not so frequent. So, Southern Tick Associated Rash Illness. And in fairness, you know, the pick that I put in there is from a patient with Lyme. Oh, but <laughs> the... The, the, the whole point of this story is that it looks exactly like erythema migrans, okay? So it is transmitted not by the Ixodes or Ixodes deer tick, okay? It's transmitted by the Lone Star tick. So remember, it comes from the south. Uh, Amblyoma americanum tick, um, 
so they've done everything on Earth to try to isolate a pathogen, but apparently they can't find one. So it appears to be, and so far what we know now is just a disease somehow associated with a tick. We do not have a Borrelia or, or an, a, a bacterial pathogen for it. Um, often they end up treated empirically for Lyme, and we, that's why it's kind of hard to learn more about this disease. Uh, but it has, I mean, in the cases that have been tracked down to the uh, Amblyoma americanum, um, I mean, it's, it hasn't been associated to the arthritis and, and neurologic complications that Lyme has. Okay, I'm going to be wrapping up pretty soon. Speaking about the Lone Star Tick, this is a distribution, as you see, is a southern tick for the most part. This graph that uh, CDC is providing is pretty generous. It doesn't distinguish the most frequent areas, which would be basically from this line that I'm uh, making here down. Okay, excuse me. So we do have some in Iowa. And we have some overlap between, you know, we have here both ticks, um, little amounts of each, but we have both. So that's, that was the amblyoma tick transmitting the um, um, starry, so um, southern tick associated rash illness. Okay, actually there was one more um, and we'll go quick. This one is important. 72 year old splenectomized patient. Okay, he got his spleen out because of an MBA in the past. Otherwise, he's healthy. He received all the immunizations for his uh, spleen taken out. Um, it's August. He was in a family reunion in Wisconsin, and three days after returning, he has fever, chill, fever and chills. He does have erythema migrans, so I keep complicating this with the erythema migrans. And he was a start on the doxycycline, and he was just sent home, which is appropriate, apparently. But he returns to the emergency room with a fever of 39.2, blood pressure very low, uh, erythema migrans is still there, but now he has petechiae. He's uh, confused or an optondic. He has crackles in both bases. Hemoglobin has dropped to 8.2 with an elevated retic count, low platelets. His chest x ray shows bilateral pulmonary edema consistent with uh, the adult respiratory uh, distress syndrome. You know, it's normal. Blood cultures were obtained, but they're obviously pending. So he was started on the doxycycline now IV plus vancomycin and sosin. So um, what should we do? Okay, I can't help, I'm sorry, I need to do this. Can the pathologist answer this one? No, okay. Okay, um, that's fine, we'll, we'll open it up. Because the other pathologist wanted to hear about this. Is he here? No, okay. Just three responses so far, four, five, six, okay. Let's keep rolling, we hit 10 or something, we, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I confused you enough. I mean, we've we've had pretty good scores today. Um, the whole point of this one, okay? He was in Wisconsin. He did get apparently Lyme, but this is what his uh, peripheral smear shows. So that the the correct answer is getting a, a peripheral smear, a thin prep, with specifically GM sustain. Okay. Now, I acknowledge the audience. This is a rare bear, one thousand cases in the U.S. per year, but it's important. And there were some clues in this case that made us think about this. So what we're see, seeing here is the erythrocytes with some inclusions in there that looks look like trophozoites, like from malaria. So this is a parasite that is invading the erythrocytes, and that's called Babesia. Okay, Babesiosis, uh, better known in the past as non-target fever, it was described in. Uh, in 1969 in Nantucket. It's a parasitic disease. It looks a lot like malaria, and, and Dr. Weider was commenting the other day, oh yeah, the, are you gonna talk about the, the, the malaria in, in the US? Well, this is, this is our malaria, if you wish. Um, it does pretty much the same that malaria does. It's, um, it infects the erythrocytes, it ruptures them, um, produces a very high fever. There's no characteristic rash associated to it, but here's the catch. It's transmitted by the same tick that transmits Lyme. So the important point here was the co-infection, okay? And the other important point here is that uh, it should be, oops, it's so unspecific and so and patient can get so ill that this is in your differential diagnosis of those fevers of unknown origin. Of course, you're gonna uh, uh, consult infectious diseases, but you wanna keep that in mind. Um, and the reason why the, the patient did not have a spleen is because the spleen is capital in clearing the Babesia, as shown here, and I want to memorize the slide. But basically, um, splenectomized patient, the first case described in 1969 was a splenectomized patient. 
uh, and he was terribly sick. Likewise, with patients with AIDS and very old patients, they do poorly because you need your good spleen to clear the, the red blood cells and you need your CD4 cells to clear Babesia. I'm going to end up with um, just a slide on co-infections that I had to redo last minute because it was lost in the way. But basically, um, the Ixodes scapularis, the deer tick, um, so remember North, Mid-Atlantic, Upper Midwest, okay, so not only New England, but also Wisconsin and, and Minnesota transmits Lyme. Oops, this is, I'm sorry, this was a last minute redo, so let me redo it for you. So it's Lyme, Babesia, okay, we just spoke about that, and I'm just throwing in another, another one here, anaplasmosis, and the one you want to worry about is Babesia, because all the other guys listed in this slide are treated with doxycycline. So if you're suspecting Lyme, you're going to be treating this uh, anaplasmosis anyway. But if you don't suspect Babesia, you're not going to be treating it with the doxycycline. Lastly, um, the other tick that we talked about, and Blioma americanum, and these are the major ticks in the U.S., is in the southeast, right? And that transmits, we talked about the STARI, which conveniently left out, I'm sorry, I apologize for this last minute video, um, the STARI, in addition to the Rocky Mountain spotted fever that we haven't had a chance to talk, and this other condition, human monocytic ehrlichiosis. What you want to know is everything is treated with oxy, except for Babesia. Okay? Um, so here are the treatment regimens that um, we can um, you know, review later, but basically uh, um, what you want to know is that, a couple of points, that um, Lyme peripheral neuropathy can be treated orally. Some people, some people are confused that, okay, it's nervous system disease or needs to be treated parenterally. It can be treated orally, okay? So I conclude with that. Um, so always on time <laughs> or past time, but um, I would appreciate any questions. I know it's a little bit esoteric. Um, the whole point is that people become familiar with this um, Doxycycline is getting, uh, I guess, unavailable sometimes. Can you That's substitute right. medicine? Excellent. I appreciate that question because that allows me to talk about my last slide. Um, so, for instance, what do you give to a, to a pregnant lady that has Lyme, right? You do not give doxycycline. You give amoxicillin or brand name ceftin, cefiroxim. Make sure it's cefiroxim acts as a teal. That's why I put ceftin in here specifically. Um, this Actually, all these three guys have proven to be equally effective. The only reason we keep talking about doxy more than anything is because, well, it treats other stuff, as we mentioned, right? So it treats the anaplasma. Um, I think there's a little bit more experience, and, um, and I bet that the ID community is more comfortable, but, but all these guys are acceptable, equally efficacious options, okay? Um, for IV, um, if you need to use IV, and that would be only for the meningitis and the carditis, uh, you use ceftriaxone. One important thing here, um, this, we didn't talk at all about Rocky Mountain because it's, it's, it's going to be rare for us, but basically that is the one diagnosis. I mean, that's a pretty serious disease, okay? And that is the one you want to give doxy no matter what. So children, you give doxy. Pregnant, you give doxy because I mean, if you don't get doxy, they die, and and that's there's no alternative like there is for Lyme, as we see here. So, thank you.